Hi everyone, uh, welcome to today's webinar on compelling insights through data visualisation, which is taking place as part of Analysis in Government Month. Um, I'm David Mays, I'm part of the Analysis in Government Month organising team. Um, I'm going to be chairing today's webinar. Um, this webinar is just one of many activities taking place uh, throughout May. Um, you can find out more about Analysis in Government Month uh, by visiting the gov.uk uh, web page as well as our event bite page uh, where you can sign up to our events. Um, you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel um, as well as following us on Twitter um, using the Twitter handle at gov underscore analysis. Um, Today's session is all about data visualisation. Um, as analysts, it's incredibly, incredibly important that we communicate the results of our analysis effectively. Um, so this session aims to give you an overview of good practice in the development of data visualisations with a particular focus on tables, graphs, maps and the use of colour. We've got three presenters today. Um, so we've got Claire Peeney, and Nancy Singh from the ONS um, and we've also got Jessica Baker um, from Ordnance Survey as well. Um, we'll be having uh, a Q&A session at the end. Um, you can submit questions um, to our presenters using the uh, Q&A panel on the right hand side of your screen. Um, please can I also encourage you to like other people's questions as well um, because I'll be selecting the most popular questions to put to our presenters. Um, that's enough um, from me as an introduction. I'm now going to hand over um, to Claire and Nancy uh, to start today's session. Thanks, David. So hi, everyone, and thank you very much for attending today's call. So my name is Nancy Singh, and I'll be presenting today with Claire Peeney. We both work in the Best Practice and Impact Division in the Office of National Statistics. So this course today, Compelling Insights Through Data Visualisation, is a bite-sized version of our course with introducing data visualisation. And it focuses on how to produce effective charts and tables to present numerical information. Today we'll cover some key concepts and principles at a quite a high level, with the main focus on best practice using tables and charts. We'll then hand over to Jess Baker from Ordnance Survey, who will run you through some good practice of using colour and maps as part of data visualisation. There's some further guidance on data viz on the Government Statistical Service website, which we'll share the link to at the end of the session. So the course today has been developed by the Best Practice and Impact Division, who support the analysis function with effective presentation and communication of statistics. We offer a range of training courses and workshops which can all be found on the website, including writing about statistics, the code of practice, and working with users. So I'll just share my slides. Right on. So what can you expect from today? So we're going to cover off the design principles that can be applied to tables and charts to ensure you get your messages across with the intended impact and clarity. It's important to highlight here that while sophisticated data visualisation can be powerful, there's a really high bar to justify its use. So instead, we really need to focus our time on getting the basics right. Often we're trying to target non-analysts, so if we want our visualisations to have impact and to influence policy makers and public opinion, then content design is vital and data visualisation is a huge part of that, which we can sometimes get wrong. By the end of the course, we hope to give you the tools and knowledge to be able to look at the visualisations that you produce through the eyes of your audience and ask yourself whether the tables and charts are doing the best job that they can to make sure that your message is getting to your audience. I just want to touch on why this course is important. So this quote is from the National Numeracy Report um, and it highlights the findings of the 2011 Skills for Life survey, which found that almost half of all adults in England lacked level one numeracy skills. That was about 17 million 16 to 65 year olds in England. 
So level one skills are the ability to recognise and use fractions, decimal places and simple percentages. And adults with, low with skills below level one may not be able to check the pay and deductions on a wage slip. So it's really, really important that we make sure that our communication and our data visualisation is really simple and clear so our audience can understand. So what is data visualisation? So have a think about how you would explain data viz and, and what it means to you. We think data visualisation is presenting complex information simply, making data easily digestible, communicating numbers in a non-technical way, presenting our numbers visually, showing patterns and trends in data, improving engagement and providing context. And these are just a few ideas. So today we're going to mostly focus on charts and tables in terms of data visualisation, but the principles of effective design are, re are relevant for all types of visualisations, whether they're used in dashboards or impact assessments, statistical publications or research papers. So we're hoping that you'll be able to go away and apply what you've learned today to whatever it is that you work on. So the term data visualisation is a 21st century expression we use to summarise the definitions that we just came up with on the previous slide, um, that using images to convey information more easily. We tend to think of data viz as more of a modern thing, but we've got a short history lesson for you. So the gentleman on the screen is William Playfair. He was born in 1759 and he was a Scottish engineer and a political economist. According to Wikipedia, he was also a millwright, an engineer, a draftsman, an accountant, an inventor, a silversmith, a merchant, an investment broker, an economist, a statistician, a pamphleteer, a translator, a publicist, a land speculator, a convict, a banker, an ardent royalist, an editor, a blackmailer and a journalist. So he had quite a career. Um, the reason that Playfair is, is in this course is because as well as all those careers, he actually was the inventor of line charts and bar charts and later on pie charts. In 1821, Playfair published a letter about the agricultural distresses, their causes and their remedies, which included some time series data. Uh, the data showed the cost of wheat and wages of a good mechanic from 1565 to 1820 in five year intervals, which you can see in this table. And it's quite hard to see any patterns in the data when it's presented in this kind of format. So Playfair visualised the data in a chart which plotted the wages of a good mechanic as a line and the cost of wheat as a bar. So what can we now see about this data? Well, both the price of wheat and wages of a mechanic are increasing over time, but the prices are increasing more quickly. So it looks like wages, the line chart, aren't keeping up with inflation. Playfair also put the centuries along the top of the chart, as well as the kings uh, at the time, just to add a bit of context. So whilst we think that fancy data visualisation is a fairly new thing, actually people have been using visualisations like this for many, many years. Let's have a think about some general principles before moving on to look at the specifics of data visualisation. If you are including data visualisation in your publication, your research paper, stop and ask yourself, why are you adding this in? How is it enhancing your user's experience and what impact does it give? When you're adding a visualisation, it should help your users do one of two things. So it should be a reference to help your audience find and reference numbers quickly, accurately and easily. Your user might want to reuse the numbers for their own analysis or reporting. Um, so we'd normally publish this in kind of a, a table in an open format. The other purpose is to convey a few key messages simply and clearly. We tend to include a verbal written summary 
to help the audience get the message alongside the visualisation. And we'd call this a demonstration as it helps the user to understand your main messages. And we should always refer back to a kind of pyramid principle when creating data visualisation. So this tells us what we should use, um, that we should use top down communication, starting with the most important message first and then adding more details as needed. So, for example, we might use a visualisation for demonstrating main messages up front and then you could add reference materials at the end of a report or in an annex. And the main thing to do when producing a visualisation is to always check your numbers um, and sense check the data, check all the numbers add up to the correct totals, make sure that you're consistent with your figures and, and don't be afraid to challenge the figures of your data sources and make sure that they really make sense. It's really important to choose the right visualisation for your data. So these are kind of the main strategies that we use in government to show patterns in data. So we've got tables, area charts, donuts, lines, maps, vertical bar charts, stat bar charts, horizontal bar charts, tree maps, bars and lines, bubbles and points. Uh, Colour is also on the screen and it's not a strategy on its own, but it's used in conjunction with others. Um, and Jess will talk a bit more about this later on in the course. And all these different strategies work well for different types of relationships within your data. As we mentioned at the beginning, today we're going to look at four common graphing strategies. These are tables, bar charts, line charts and pie charts. Um, and then Jess will talk about using maps and will detail best practice in using colour along with the design principles. Um, so remember that it's really, really important to choose the right visualisation to get your key messages across correctly. So as we can see in this slide, that might not be happening. So I'll give you a couple of seconds to have a look and, and see if you can figure out what is going on in this slide. Um, have have you guys chosen the right data visualisation here? Can you tell what, what's going on? So at first glance, it looks like it's a pie chart, but as your brain starts to process what it's seeing, you realise that actually this isn't a pie chart at all. Uh, you can see all the different uh, preferences for pizza toppings, uh, and the numbers add up to much more than 100%. And there's even some more categories down at the bottom of the screen that haven't even been included in the visualisation. So the pie chart metaphor here has been broken and this causes cognitive dissonance for your audience. And it's actually quite counterproductive. So it's really important when we're using visualisation that we really understand why we're using it and that we're using it correctly. So we've just seen that how our brain looks at a pie chart and, and how it should show how parts make up a whole. And if it doesn't add up, then that adds to our cognitive load. Um, so the four that we'll look through today, so in the simplest forms, tables, they help users to look up values or compare them for reference. Bar charts help users compare the sizes of different categories. Line charts are good for displaying time series data and pie charts show how parts make up a whole. And we'll go through all of these in a bit more detail. So I'll now hand you over to Claire, who's going to cover off best, best practice when using tables. Thanks, Nancy. OK, so thank you for that um, introduction into data visualisation. I'm now going to cover tables uh, and good practice when constructing them. So why cover tables? Well, when a graph um, maybe doesn't seem to be working, a well-designed table may well be the answer and not everyone gets these right. So hopefully this next section will cover some tips to ensure we are getting the best out of tables. So when to use a table? Um, it's important to ask yourself why you're including a table 
So tables are often used when you want to present numbers clearly and systematically and have features which make them suited to certain types of data. So with a table, you enable your audience to look up specific values or compare individual values in a table. You can include uh, values and derived measures such as percentages or indices. You can include summary statistics such as means or totals. You can show data values with a great range between the smallest and largest numbers and you can encourage reuse. So users may want to use the data published in a table in their own analysis later and by publishing this data, you enable them to do this. So when to use the table? Um, sometimes graphs just don't work, uh, like in this example that you can see on this slide. So many of the uh, smaller categories at the top of this um, pie chart are so small that you can't really see them in the chart. Um, a table would therefore be better at capturing the kind of differing uh, magnitudes of the figures shown here. Um, here is the same chart in a later release. Uh, we can see that there have been some improvements, but um, they've still had to label the small uh, schemes at the bottom of the donut chart. Um, so for this particular example, we think it's much clearer as a table and you can see this on the on the right hand side it just makes it a lot easier to kind of see the smaller categories and the proportions. So moving on to different types of tables, uh, there are two main types that we use. So reference tables and uh, demonstration tables. So starting firstly with reference tables. So these are typically large. They contain lots of columns and rows of numbers um, and they're often found in an appendix or in an accompanying table to a uh, publication. Um, Whereas demonstration tables are used to illustrate a particular point and they're often found within a document rather than um, being a standalone table kind of on their own. Uh, there's an example of a reference table on this slide. Um, we want our users to be able to read off the numbers so you should help them um, kind of when you're deciding how to lay out your lay out your table. Um, in this example, we can see that the user is interested in a particular section of the table and they can now easily go and take this information and do their own analysis. As you can see, they've done here by producing this specific chart on a sec specific section of the table. Um, demonstration tables. So the other type of table we can use are demonstration tables. Um, here is an example using the ONS national population projection releases. Demonstration tables um, should be short and simple because they are used to make a single point or an argument. So only the numbers um, that convey your message should be used in these types of tables. It's uh, often useful to have a few demonstration tables as opposed to one large table that is trying to show um, a few things as often the message can then be lost. Um, also, it's good practice to match the uh, demonstration tables closely with the commentary. Um, this is so that the reader can see the point being made in the commentary um, then being emphasised with the um, accompanying table in the demonstration table. So moving on to uh, footnotes. So wherever possible, you should put accompanying information at the point it is required rather than directing users to a different place to interpret what something means. So jumping around um, from one section of text to another can be disruptive for all uh, types of users. Um, so for example, if a number has been revised in a table, ideally we would write out the word revised in full next to that figure rather than using, rather than just putting in an, an R, a shorthand. Um, now, having said that, there might be situations where we can't keep writing out the word revised in full. So maybe it's a large table. So here, um, using shorthand would be okay, but you should define what this shorthand means before the user gets to the table. Um, 
and when using words or shorthand in a table we advise you to put the text in square back bracket so for example you'd put a square bracket around the word revised or around the word r um, when more complex notes are necessary you will need to use a note marker and again here we advise putting the word note followed by the number of the note in square brackets so for example note one um, you would then explain what this note means in the body text of the page directly underneath the table um, and again ideally you wouldn't use superscript here because screen readers um, often cannot differentiate between superscript text from other text. Okay, so I'm now going to run through an example of how we might go about formatting a table using best practice. So if we're using a table, we need to remember some general rules about how we present the numbers in the table. So I'm going to take you through this quite simple table um, and hopefully uh, we can all agree that there are a few, th a few things that need um, improving here. So the first thing that we can do um, is add in some commas which should make the numbers presented in the table easier to read. Um, you should use commas to separate thousands in numbers of four digits or more. You should not use spaces. Um, the only exception here is if you're writing years. So for example, the year 2020, this should have no um, punctuation. The next thing um, we can do is add a zero before any numbers that are less than one. So in this example, you can see that we have done this here for the senior civil service percentage column. Next is using a consistent um, level of precision. So thinking about how much precision your users need. In this example, we have gone for one decimal place. Um, the level of rounding uh, that you use should be chosen according to your intended use. So base, base this kind of level on precision uh, on the needs of your users. Next, we have rounding. So we should round um, appropriately. Presenting too much detail can make things harder for users. Simplifying numbers by rounding makes numbers easier to read. Um, if you do round numbers in tables, you should make a note of this so that users are aware. Um, this could also affect things like totals. So parts of the table uh, might not necessarily sum to the total due to rounding. So you should make uh, your users aware of this. Next, we have alignment. So we should write align numbers and column headings as we, ha as we have done um, in this example. Again, this should help the user of the table when making comparisons. So we fixed the number um, of formatting problems. We now need to focus on the table itself. So one thing we can do here is remove um, unnecessary grid lines that don't help the user navigate the table. The next thing we can do um, is some formatting of the text. So things like making the titles and headers bold. The next thing is about ordering categories um, in a way that makes the most sense. So for this example, we've started here by putting them in alphabetical order. And again, when you're ordering your table, um, you should think about what makes the most sense for your users. So an alternative option to alphabetical order might be to order them um, in grade order, as we've done here. Um, or in grade order, but in highest grade to lowest grade. So this decision should be based on what you think your users would find the most useful. Remember to um, engage with your users to kind of seek feedback on how you're presenting your information. The next thing is um, white space. So we can also use white space to make these groupings um, clearer, as demonstrated in this example. Another thing we can do is um, give a more descriptive title. So here we have made some changes to the title to make it clearer um, what the title includes. Um, 
if publishing on a HTML web page or in a document, so a Word document maybe, um, the title needs to be outside the table in the body text and should be marked up as an appropriate um, heading. The next thing is about note markers. So these should be made um, accessible. So when we are producing um, any data visualizations, we need to make our work accessible. So this is covered in um, legislation. In terms of note markers, there should be these should be in standard font rather than using uh, superscript, which um, I mentioned earlier is not always accessible to uh, screen readers. So here we advise using putting the words note one in square brackets um, after the title, as we've done in this example. Um, also, just to give a quick plug to a session our colleague is running um, next week. So Hannah is running a session on how to make spreadsheets accessible. So if you're interested in learning more about this, then I'd encourage you to sign up for that session, which I believe is happening um, on the 26th of May at half one. So this is a reminder of um, what the table looked like before we started doing all that um, reformatting. And this is the one that we have finished up with. So hopefully uh, you agree that we have made it a lot easier to read and interpret. And I'm going to hand over back to Nancy now um, to cover charts. Thank you, Claire. Um, so we're now going to move on to look at charts. So when should you use a graph? So graphs are used to summarise something complex, to tell a memorable story, to reveal insight that would otherwise be hidden in something like text or a table, and they can also be used for quality assurance or error detection. There are lots of different options for chart use, and you can see, as you can see on the screen. In government, we tend to use bar charts, both vertical and horizontal, and line charts the most. So we have seen people try out kind of tree maps and bubble charts, but again, you need to think about your audience and how well they'll understand your visualizations before you use them. We know that the type of visualization we choose will help our audience interpret the data and see the main stories more easily. So this on the screen is some data from the Rural Payment Payments Agency. It's some time series data um, and it's measuring the same thing at regular time points. The example is um, of the volume of wholesale milk deliveries in the UK between 2003 and 2014 15 apparently not butter fat adjusted. Um, and the narrative next to the table stated that this data is intended as a guide to trends in milk production. But they haven't really made it very easy for us to see what the trends are, particularly in a table. We can help our users understanding um, and give, give a better insight to the data um, and also allow for kind of visualizations of patterns by manipulating the data into a different format. So we could plot the, plot the series and graphing this data makes um, working time series very easy because the graph gives a visual representation that is very quick to interpret. So by looking at this graph now, you can describe the behavior of the series. What, what, so what can we see from what's going on in this chart? So we can see, is it going up or down? Yeah, we can see the data going up. Is the growth constant? in the period, I'd say kind of barely, so like the site increased. Are there any period patterns? So we can probably see something seasonal happening. And are there any peaks and troughs in the same period? We can see that there are some troughs in January and peaks in March, and the peaks look like they're increasing over time. But it's clear that we can spot a lot more in a graph compared to just using a table alone. So bar charts, bar charts are really great for comparing the size or magnitude of different categories. Humans have a good natural ability to compare both vertical and horizontal length. So you might wonder why we would choose a horizontal bar over a vertical bar. 
Um, so we're just as good at comparing the sizes, but horizontal bar charts are good if we have long category names or have lots of categories which don't fit onto a standard portrait orient orientated page. So it can be as simple as that really. These types of bar charts on the slide are for categorical bar charts. So the order of the categories is not set. It depends on the story that you want to tell. So for example, you might want to rank them from highest to lowest or cluster them in subgroups. Uh, sometimes you might have a set order if you're showing data um, at a regional level. But again, just think about what the data is showing, what the message is and what will be easiest for your user to understand. Labels are about adding precision and detail. However, a graph typically shouldn't be used to communicate precision and detail. They're more about showing the trends and the stories within the data. So if you need to add lots of labels to your chart, you probably need to take a step back and think, should you be using a chart or actually would a table be better? So often labels can make charts harder to read and they can make a graph look more cluttered like in this example. And they also distract from the story of the graph. The message is getting distorted and you're making your audience work a lot harder to interpret what's going on. So if you really think you do need to use a chart and you need to label it, make sure you follow best practice and, and tidy up your labels as much as you can. So on the right, we've removed the percentage signs because we've got that in our axes and we've left aligned all the labels. And um, so we can, focus on the, the paths and the bars rather than trying to pick out the numbers on the left hand side. So it's really, really important that you always start your X axis on a bar chart at zero. So looking at this graph, what would you kind of think that it's telling us about average household income in Wales and Scotland if you compared the two? So if I didn't look at the labels and, and didn't notice that the graph wasn't starting at zero. It looks to me like Wales have an average weekly income that is about half of that of Scotland, roughly, maybe a little bit less. But actually, looking at the axes labels, we can now see that it's about 10% greater or only £45 more. So your, our human brains will always try and compare the relative size of the bars. It has to work a lot harder to interpret the graph when the bars are not proportional to the values that they represent. So if we don't start the axis at zero, our users are likely to misinterpret the data and make incorrect comparisons. And we could get in trouble for misleading our users. This happened in 2018. And um, so the Department for Education had a bit of a telling off from the chair of the UK Statistics Authority for using a truncated axis in a tweet about school spending. So the axis here is starting at 36 million and is kind of um, overemphasizing maybe the message more than it should. So moving on to line charts now. So line charts are good at showing data over time um, or time series data. It's good practice to label the line directly. So even if you've only got one series on your chart, we would still advise labeling it directly. If we've got more than one variable, we might want to use things like color or data points or different textures um, to differentiate as long as you can make sure that these are accessible. So if you're using different colors to, to differentiate between your categories, you need to consider the accessibility and the printing issue, which we'll touch on a bit later on. Um, data points aren't used very often because they add clutter to a chart and they're quite hard to read. And texture lines uh, might suggest that one category is less important or is a forecast um, or might be provisional. Um, so as I said, it's really good practice to label the category names in the line chart. So this is preferred over a separate legend um, as it allows your user to see all the information in one glance. So even if you only have one line, it saves your user from looking back and forth from the line to the legend and, and checking what's what. If you have lines that cross over quite a lot, it can be more difficult to label your lines clearly. So in this case, a legend might potentially be a better option. 
but we've shown both options on the screen. Um, placing your legend in the body of the graph rather than next to or below the graph just makes things a lot easier to view in a single graph, in a single glance, sorry. So can you use a uh, bar chart for time series data? So you, you definitely can use it for one series, but it gets a little bit harder to follow if you've got more than one series. So these are a couple of comparisons between line charts and bar charts for showing time series data. Let's have a think about multiple lines of data. So how many lines might we say is too many lines on a line graph? We'd probably say that this is too many lines. So the lines here are very thick, they overlap each other and obscure pretty much all the detail in the trends of the data. So this is quite an old example from some ONS revisions for um, the GDP notes. And it's supposed to show that the revisions to GDP are generally quite small. That's why you can't let's see the detail. Um, but it's probably a bit too much information to put into a line graph. Instead, something like this might look a little bit better. So four is usually about as much as we can deal with. Um, as I said, try and make sure that your lines are easily distinguishable um, probably by using colour over uh, textures and data points. And you can see they look a little bit too cluttered here. Um, if we go to colour, it's slightly more successful, but this can be hard to get right. Um, and Jess will explain a bit more shortly. Um, so do you think that the X axis on, uh, on a line graph needs to start at zero? So here's an example of the differences caused by starting um, an axis at zero or starting it somewhere else. So if your axis doesn't start at zero, you need to make it clear and explain why it doesn't. Um, so we would suggest that you could present two versions of the chart alongside each other. So one on the right acts, in, acts as a bit of a zoomed in version of the one on the left, and it can help you better tell your story. So in this example, the graph on the right is being used to highlight the fall in measles, mumps and rubella immunisation levels. So 88% is the level at which we kind of have herd immunity effect, and, and it's a bit dangerous to fall below that. So adding the context and adding a target on there and zooming in on the data just gives us a bit more information than we would get on the chart on the left hand side. So you don't always need to start your y axis at zero. For indexes in particular, the y axis doesn't need to start at zero either, as it's 100 that is the reference point rather than zero. So when we run this course with smaller groups, we usually give you this chart. Um, and we'd spend some time thinking about what improvements you might make to this visualisation. So this example is from the Welsh Government and it shows the attendances at major accident and emergency departments in Wales. Um, so what might we do to improve the presentation of this chart? Thinking about kind of what we've learned about bar charts and line charts. So we would say a line chart would potentially be a bit better than a bar chart. We would label the lines directly um, and tone down kind of the secondary element. So remove unnecessary background colour rather than the sort of grey background. We're just using colour where we need to show data. We have realigned the months repositioned the label so it's a bit clearer to see what we're showing, change the title, as I mentioned, clearer titles make things a lot easier to understand. Um, and there was a methodology change. So you might have noticed a physical break um, on, the, on the previous chart, a kind of dotted line. Um, and it's up to you really how you, how you want to deal with this. So we think that you, know, you could use a physical break, but that's a little bit harder to, to create. So something like a dotted line probably works better. 
um, when the change results in a spike or a fall, this draws a bit more attention to it. Um, and it's generally good practice to kind of add some annotation on to explain what, what's going on so there's a change in methodology. So we think that chart looks a lot better than the bar chart and it's much easier to understand at a glance. The final section we're going to look at is on pie charts. Um, and these are probably one of the most controversial charts. I know people in government have quite mixed feelings on using pie charts. Um, but they can be good for showing part to whole relationships. Um, so people often jump to using pie charts for part to whole relationships. But a bar chart is also quite a good way of showing this relationship. So in this example on the screen, um, it's much easier to see what's happening in the bar charts on the right than it is to see what's happening in the pie chart. The only problem with the bars is that they don't show you that the categories are part of a whole. Um, and the, part of the pie chart does make that a lot clearer. And we intu intuitively know that pie charts are part of a whole. As with this example as well, the bar chart on the right shows the small differences between the categories much more easily than the pie chart on the left. And um, they all look quite similar and it's probably hard to tell whether A is bigger than C in the pie chart. But you might not want to show these small differences, for example, if you know they're down to random noise, something like the pie chart might be better um, for your example. Um, often we also end up resorting to adding labels onto pie charts because a chart alone isn't always clear enough. It can be really useful to use pie charts instead of bar charts when you have a dominant category. So in a bar chart, a smaller category is often dwarfed, as we can see with this other category. Um, and it can also cause problems with the y-axis scale. So this example is much clearer. Um, and you can see that retail is a dominant category. So can we use pie charts to show changes over time? In short, no, um, not least because these are just awful to look at, but pie charts are just a pretty terrible way of comparing differences over time. You have to use multiple ch pie charts, which is a lot of effort for you as a producer to produce. Um, but it's a lot of work for your reader to also process and interpret. Pie charts, however, are quite useful if you want to illustrate a significant change between two time periods. So here we can see quite a big difference in the 10 years between these two pie charts, um, and that can be quite a powerful message in a pie chart. Just wanted to show you some alternative part to whole graphs that can be used instead of a pie chart. So bottom right, we've got a donut chart. These help to emphasize the sort of angular length, which the brain is quite good at. So essentially it's just a, a bar chart bent round into a circle. Um, this is perhaps better than a pie chart because a pie chart emphasizes area. And it's quite useful in an infographic because you can put your total in the middle, for example. Um, we also have stacked bar charts. So these are a little bit harder to see a trend as the middle sections don't align to a hor uh, to horizon value. So for example, these kind of mid blue categories straddle 60% and it's hard to know exactly what the value is. And your brain will sort of naturally blend the ascending colors when they appear next to each other, which can make it a little bit harder. At the top right, we've got some tree maps. So in a tree map, the data is divided up into rectangles based on the sizes within a hierarchy. Tree maps can look quite nice, um, but comparing the relative size of rectangles is again, cognitively harder than it is with bars. So you might need to resort to labeling them. Um, and finally, bottom left, we've got a bubble chart. So these can take quite a while to get your head around, but we have seen them used in government. So while it's visually appealing, it again can be cognitively, cognitively quite difficult. Um, it's not particularly easy to produce in sort of your standard software like Excel, um, and getting the circles right proportionally isn't always straightforward. People can find it quite hard to compare the relative size of circles as well. 
but it does give you a good sense of the hierarchy once you've ironed out or overcome the difficulties with creating the different side circles. So I'll now hand you back over to Claire to talk you through some top tips for graphs. Thanks, Nancy. So I'm now going to cover some top tips for graphs and then finish the session uh, talking about accessibility. So the first tip is don't use um, 3D. So luckily we don't see many 3D graphs in government um, anymore, but just wanted to cover this point here um, as it's important to show how much 3D can distort the data. So if we take a look at this um, 3D pie chart, we can see that category um, A at the top and category E at the bottom um, look fairly similar in size. If we then plot the same data um, on a bar chart, as you can see on the right hand side, um, it's clear that A is considerably larger than E. So as a general rule, um, steer clear of using 3D in charts. The next tip is uh, don't use um, exploded pies. So Nancy just spoke a bit about um, pie charts. In terms of um, exploding them, it can uh, distort the pattern. So our brains um, then often focus on the exploded bit of the chart. Um, it also makes it harder to compare angles as they don't all have the same um, central point. Next tip um, is around background pictures. So uh, we should not add background pictures um, to charts as we can see has been done here on the right hand um, side. So this takes um, our attention away from the chart and can make them harder to interpret. Um, a really important point and thing to remember is to maximise the data to ink ratio. So by this we mean um, don't use ink on anything which isn't providing information. So unfortunately um, programs such as Excel can add a lot of unnecessary um, things by default. So this graph on the top left um, uses the default settings from an older version of Excel. Um, it's added a grey background, it's put boxes around everything, it's had mar added marker symbols onto the lines on the chart. Um, and our advice would just be to turn off all the things that you don't need um, and then turn it back on piece by piece if you think it's really needed. So uh, the chart on the right um, is much cleaner and less um, cluttered. So in this example, um, we've removed the borders around the chart and the legend. We've faded the grid lines back to um, a much lighter gray color. Um, they are still there to improve uh, readability, but they can be very faint and still um, achieve this. We've got rid of the um, background shading and we've taken away the data markers on the lines as well. Um, next point is around annotation. So another thing you can do is add annotations to your charts where this helps um, tell the story. So annotations can be used to highlight um, key features, to provide context um, and avoid misinterpretation. So this example um, is from the Office for National Statistics uh, Deaths Registered Weekly publication. So you can see that they've annotated um, bank holidays on this particular chart since the number of um, deaths registered in a week are affected um, when bank holidays occur. So they've added on this um, uh, annotation to kind of add that context and avoid um, misinterpretation of the chart. The next thing is around um, using accessible fonts. So we should use um, a single accessible font in your um, visualization or in your document. So don't use different fonts um, in the same document, HTML page visualization, um, whatever it is you're producing. Um, 
sans serif fonts are accessible. So examples of these, um, or a common one that we, most of us have probably heard of is Arial. There's some other ones um, up on the slide. We should um, only kind of use bold font for um, headings and not um, use italics. And we should keep um, changes in font size to a minimum and avoid using very small fonts. Um, in general, we recommend using a minimum uh, font size of 12. Next up, um, we should be consistent with colours um, that we use in our reports for visualize any visualisations that you include, um, but also across reports if possible. So it's likely um, that your department has guidance on branding and colour palettes that you should be using when producing um, visualisations. So th this example that we've got here um, shows that within the same uh, publication, a different colour had been used to illustrate the um, total line on these two different charts, which could be um, misleading and makes it harder, um, just makes it harder for the reader to kind of interpret. There's more kind of effort on their part, so we should um, avoid doing this. So that was some top tips with charts. I'm now going to do um, a short section on accessibility in terms of tables and charts. So um, when we are producing uh, data visualizations, we need to make sure that these are accessible. So this means um, designing content so that it can be used by as many people as possible. So this includes those with impaired vision, motor difficulties, cognitive impairments or learning difficulties, deafness or um, impaired hearing. The code of practice for statistics, for example, says that um, the needs of different types of users and potential users should be considered when um, determining ways of presenting and releasing statistics and data. Um, any content published on a public sector website must meet the AA standard for the web content accessibility guidelines by law. Um, moving on to accessibility and tables. So I spoke a bit about tables earlier. So demonstration um, tables, so tables that we use to support a specific point. Um, should be coded into the HTML of, a, of the web page your publication is on. If you're publishing um, a table in a document, such as a PDF, it will need to be marked up as a table. Um, but PDF and other document format should really um, now be a last resort for any new publications. Wherever possible, uh, publications should be made available in HTML. Um, Making reference tables published in spreadsheets accessible is trickier. So recently, um, the best practice and impact division that myself and Nancy are a part of um, has published a draft update um, to government statistical service guidance on releasing statistics in spreadsheets. Um, so that's available available now. Um, feedback's very welcome on that. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, if you're particularly interested in this, then there's a session next week on making um, spreadsheets accessible, which you may want to um, sign up for. And then finally, um, moving on to look at charts. So as with tables, um, charts should be embedded into the HTML code of the web page um, that your publication is on wherever possible. Um, at the moment, um, gov.uk only allows us to build horizontal bar charts. Um, so that is a bit of a limitation, obviously. Um, if you happen to work at the Office for National Statistics, then your options are much wider. Um, because of this um, problem I just mentioned with gov.uk, um, you may sometimes need to upload an image of a chart. Um, if this is the case and there are areas of accessibility that you need to um, be addressing. So, oh, I seem to have moved on a lot of slides there. Let me see if I can go back. There we go. Um, so when a chart is presented as an image, it needs to be accessible. So 
um, accessible colours. So colour blindness affects the ability to distinguish between colours. So we need to make sure the ones we use are accessible. And Jessica is going to cover this a bit more in her session. Um, any text included on the chart should be in a sans serif font in a big enough size, usually um, at least size 12, uh, as I mentioned earlier. There should be an appropriately tagged title in the body text of the web page or document so that screen readers can understand how content is structured. There should be alternative text describing the message of the chart. So this can be in the uh, alt attribute, which is in the HTML code or in the body text. So the text that's on the web page. Um, you should also provide the data behind the chart in an accessible format. So this is considered a best practice in terms of presentation and dissemination and will allow users to further further explore the data and carry out their own um, analysis. It's also um, best practice to include text stating the source for the data used to create a chart directly after each chart image um, and also to supply the image of the chart, chart in SVG, so scalable vector format. Um, this is considered the most accessible option for images of charts. So that's the end um, of that section on accessibility and top tips for charts. Um, so just to summarise what we have covered, um, Nancy started off the session um, outlining what data visualisation is and why data visualisation is important. And we then went on to cover um, tables, different types of charts, top tips for graphs and accessibility. Um, so we've just explored how basic uh, design principles can be applied to ensure you get across the message you intend to with clarity and impact. So hopefully um, this should enable you to apply best practice when designing tables and charts and help you to ensure your audience understands uh, the messages in your data. So I hope you all um, found that section of today uh, useful. I'm going to hand over now to uh, Jessica from Ordnance Survey. Great. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Nancy. Um, yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so thanks all for, for coming to this session. It's really good that there's so many people who are here today. Um, my name's Jess Baker and I've been working at Ordnance Survey for about a year and a half. Um, and I was involved with a project about a year ago, uh, it started out, which was creating some colourblind accessible maps. And that was really the piece of work which first got me involved with kind of championing accessibility in the geospatial industry and making sure that our maps are as good as they can be. So I will just share my slides. OK, so the way that I'm planning to structure this session is to firstly go through some of the really key principles of cartographic design for creating really good and really effective maps. Um, and then I'll be talking a little bit more about my work that I did to make those colourblind accessible maps um, at Ordnance Survey. And then I'll finish off the session with some tips and tricks that you can use to hopefully make maps that you're creating a bit more accessible to people with colour blindness and different types of visual impairments. So I'll get started with the eight key cartographic design principles and really um, a great tool for becoming a better map maker, if that's something that you do within your role, is to follow these principles. They might not all be applicable to the types of maps and visualisations that you're creating, but by following these and kind of really considering them when you're putting together um, something that is going to be going to a customer, whether that's internal or external, will help, help to make sure that your maps are going to be as good as they can be. And these eight principles were put together by the geographic data visualization team at Ordnance Survey. And to compile those, they used inspiration from um, a lot of the different design principles that exist across other disciplines as well. So they come from quite a wide range of sources. 
and and really by following these um, and then making a really great map um, you're going to be able to communicate your message in a story that your map is wanting to tell a lot more effectively and a really good map is going to be really easy to interpret and easy to follow for the user so I will go through each of these eight principles in a little bit more detail. And the first of those is understanding the requirements of your user. And really that's gonna be really vital to the success of any map that you're creating. And making sure that the story you're trying to tell is really clearly communicated to the user. And that's only gonna work if you fully understand what their requirements are, what their brief is, and we'll make sure that you're not gonna end up with loads of amendments that you've got to make further down the line. So don't be afraid to ask your customer questions or challenge their viewpoints if you're unsure or disagree with something that they're saying and it's important as well to start the design process of making your map by really researching and identifying those real user needs so what sort of information does the story require which elements of the map are the most important to highlight and how is the map going to be used as well and the time that you spend understanding those needs from the outset is going to save you a lot of time later on uh, again not having to make those amendments in the future and the map that's on the screen here is beck's map of the london underground and this is a really good example it's a very famous map i'm sure we've all probably seen it before um, it's a really great example of a map that's been created with the user in mind because somebody who's riding on the london underground is less interested about the geographical relationships between each of the tube stops and the actual distances between those but they obviously do want to know a lot more about the relationships between each line and each station on on each um, line on the map. Then the second uh, principle which is important to consider is about the display format and the way that your map is going to be perceived by the user. So understanding that format and the way that your story is going to be told on the map is super important because the map might be needed to be shown um, in a printed format or perhaps it'll be on a screen or a mobile phone um, maybe all of the above and if your map's interactive as well it's important to consider that and the way that the map user is going to interact with it so the colors that you're using for creating your map are important for that and if you're using a map that's going to be displayed on a screen or creating a map for that it's important to use the rgb color formats and if you're creating a map for print it's going to be uh, the CMYK colour formats that you want to use for those. And the map here, the example on this slide, so this is from the um, re-election of President Obama in 2012 and the Wall Street Journal printed this map alongside an editorial which was downplaying his victory. Um, and this printed map probably looked really good on their screens when they were putting it together but actually the newspaper is printed in black and white and so when that map is translated into a black and white format it just completely loses all impact and you can't tell which state is supposed to be which color at all so it's it's kind of really lost everything that it was supposed to be showing um, and for us a lot of the time this is probably more about knowing how your customer is going to be um, accessing the map. Maybe they're going to be printing it off. And if they are, often you'll want to ask the question of whether they're going to be printing it in colour or if they've even got access to a colour printer, because sometimes they actually don't. And that's obviously going to be quite a big consideration that you're going to have to take into account when putting that map together for them. The third principle just to go through is thinking about the hierarchy of the visuals that you're including in your map. So in particular, this is about making sure that your user is seeing the information that's the most important first um, and that that's going to really jump out at them and be the first thing that the eye is drawn to when they look at the map. So there's quite a, lot, a large range of visual variables that you can use to help achieve that. And those are things like the colours, um, the shape of the forms that you're using in the map, the size and the fonts as well that are included. And they can all help to really bring out that visual hierarchy. And also the backdrop of the map is an important consideration. Um, you want to make sure that that's going to be one that really complements the data that's being overlaid onto it by helping to ensure that that data is the thing that people are seeing first. Some map features in that backdrop might seem less important, but they also 
are probably still going to be required to add context in a lot of situations. So you might need to make sure that those features appear, but they're in the background, maybe in a slightly more muted shade or with a bit of transparency applied to them so that they are still there for context, but they're not going to be cluttering up the map and drawing the eye away from the central point or the data that you want to highlight. And this map on the screen is a really good example of visual hierarchy because the deeply saturated base map in the background really recedes to the background whilst the bright colours that are popping out at the front um, really draw your eye to the data which the map is trying to show. And the layout of this map is really clever as well because the compass in the centre acts both as the legend but also augments the maps um, and each map on this visualisation represents a point on the compass and depicts the proportion of tornadoes by bearing weighted um, their distance and the intensity across the USA. So I think this map is a good example because it really makes you think and also um, it kind of demands the viewer to, to look a bit more deeply and kind of brings the viewer into the map. Um, so it's a really effective way of communicating that message and that data that they were trying to show. Then the next principle of cartographic design is really just about keeping things simple um, and you want to avoid including unnecessary information because that's going to make your story and your map harder to read and therefore less effective. Um, and really thinking about when you're including data in the map, if it needs to be there, if it doesn't, then simply just don't show it. If, if a feature in the map isn't adding any value, then it's just cluttering up from um, detracting from the main message and the data that you're wanting to display. And I think it is quite easy and there is a temptation a lot of the time to over embellish and kind of go over the top, which risks confusing the user and again, diverting their attention away from the main message. And a lot of the time really just think about less is more and uh, keeping things simple. So the examples on this slide are two images which were from a set made recently to show whereabouts in Great Britain the public have been walking. Um, and this data comes from the OS Maps app and the images show 10 years worth of data. So it's, it's a dense amount of data. There's a lot to show in these maps. Um, but because of that, it's been important to keep them really simple with no labels and no topographic details where it's not necessary. Um, and a simple multiplicity effect has been added to really bring out that line work and help emphasise those areas where the most people have been walking across GB. Then the next principle we're going to talk about is legibility. So you want to make sure that all the elements in your map are readable, understandable and recognisable. And that applies to all parts of the map, um, whether that is a, a map itself or any kind of supplementary charts, or graphs or text which are sitting around the outside of the map as well. And legibility of most features in maps depends on the colour and the size of them. Your text can be made legible with a good choice of font, um, good colour contrasts against the backdrop, suitable font sizes, uh, thinking about the character spacing in those fonts as well. And also a really good way to make fonts stand out and make text stand out is to use masks or halos around the edge of the letters as a bit of an outline. And the proximity of elements to each other is important to the overall legibility of a map too. So where um, symbols and texts overlapping, you really want to avoid that because it's going to, again, add clutter and make the information a lot less clear to the user. And the Financial Times actually are an example of, of data journalists who are doing some really excellent work in data visualisation with clear and legible maps. They've got quite an identifiable style, which really tells the user that a map, if they see it out of context, is from the Financial Times. Um, and they use really clear and legible fonts as well. And there's just enough context in those maps without them becoming too cluttered. The next principle is thinking about consistency. So if you're creating maps where there's kind of a series of maps, um, you want to maintain consistency in the styling between those so that you've got a bit of a sense of balance between them all. Um, oh, just click too far there. So 
maintaining consistency across maps um, means that features are going to be perceived as kind of organized into groups and it helps the maps to have a bit of a shared identity across uh, a wide variety if there's a, a series of maps or you're kind of mapping a lot of different areas in isolation but you want it to maintain that clear style throughout um, and I think something that people not, don't necessarily realize a lot of the time but actually having really clear consistent maps can help install a degree of confidence in the user that the maps that they're reading are, are from a reliable source and they're all making up part of that wider set. Um, it just creates a much more polished look. And then thinking about the composition of maps as well. So this concerns kind of the arrangement of all of those different visual elements that are making up your overall visualization. So that's including things like a map's title and a scale bar. Um, and it concerns both how the map is structured and positioned, but also how the map works alongside any additional information that you want to include uh, next to it. And all of the map elements that you're putting together should really work together to provide that clear and complete understanding to the user. So their style wants to be really harmonious and complementary in the colours that you're using and the fonts that you're using as well. And the aim here is really to get that balance, but also you might want to think about a kind of visual path, a visual path that you want to take the user on. So if there's something that you want to draw the eye to first, um, and then look at a supplementary piece of information, for example, that's also a good consideration to have. And, and I think this is a really important stage actually in the design process, because if you're not getting this right and not getting the composition there, then it can undermine all of the effort that you've put in so far to get the map to where you want it to be um, beforehand. And the example on the screen here is a good one because the map's got a lot of elements. There's a huge amount of information that's being displayed there, but there's a good balance between them all and it has a nice overall composition. And the map itself is obviously the most important element. So that's placed right in the center, nice and big. Um, it's clearly defined from that supporting contextual information. And things like the title, the north arrow and the logo sit down in the visual plane because they're only really secondary supporting elements. Um, and I think the, the really bright pink color on this map cover and the timeline helps to frame the map and focus the viewer into the center as well at the map that they, they want to display first. And then the last principle of cartographic design of those sets is accessibility um, and that leads quite well into the rest of the presentation which I'm going to be giving today. So there's quite a few different accessibility factors to consider in the design process when we're putting our map together that we want to tell a story. So one of those is the distribution format that the map is going to be sent out in. So maybe your customer is wanting it in a PDF um, and so you need to make sure that they can open that in a PDF or if you are sending it in some sort of GIS format in a slightly more technical way that they've got the software and the ability to open that at their end. And then another consideration for accessibility is user disabilities. So things like colour blindness. Um, and the example here on the screen is what I'm going to be talking about a bit more in detail. So. This is a new set of style sheets, so kind of colour schemes that we created at OS for different types of colour blindness. Um, and I'm going to go through some top tips for creating accessible maps and visualisations for colour blindness at the end of this session as well. And then a third section for accessibility that's important to consider. So is your map going to be sitting behind a paywall? Um, it might be on a website that you have to create an account and sign up for or be needed to be viewed in some software that isn't free to download and it's not open source. And then the last thing is how easy is your map going to be to use? So if you're wanting it to be viewed on a mobile phone or it's a more interactive map, how easy is it going to be for your user to do that? And do they have that hardware and software to be able to view your map on a website or on a phone, for example? And then um, thinking about colour blindness a little bit again. So that's what I'm going to lead into in a second. Um, and the kind of relevance of that is some work that I did about a year ago, as I mentioned, to create these new style sheets, one for people with red, green and one for those with blue, yellow colour blindness. 
and I will go into that now. So colour blindness is something that not all of us um, experience. I don't have it myself, so it's it's important to get that grounding and get the context and really understand um, what it is and what we're trying to uh, make maps accessible for. Um, so colour blindness or colour vision deficiency, which is often shortened to CVD, is caused by one of the cones in the eye not being able to perceive different parts of the visible colour spectrum. And that means that the person who's um, viewing is going to see colour differently to somebody who doesn't have colour blindness. And the spectrums at the bottom of this slide show how differently these different colours are perceived. And you can see it really does alter the visible colours that a person can see quite significantly. Um, and there are different levels of severity of colour blindness. And the examples at the bottom of this slide show that kind of more extreme end of the scale. But actually, a lot of people with colour blindness would have something that sits in between that standard and fully colour blind vision. And there's two, a few different types of, of colour blindness. So something called deuteranopia and another case called protonopia, which are both commonly thought of as the red green colour blindness because red and green shades are the hardest for those people to differentiate between. And then we've also got tritonopia, which is often known as blue yellow colour blindness, because again, it's the blue and the yellow hues that are the hardest for those people to distinguish between. And then achromatopsia, which is where there is essentially monochrome vision with no colour at all. And deuteranopia is by far the most common form of colour blindness. So um, that's the red green colour blindness. Whereas blue yellow blindness is much more rare and actually monochrome vision only affects around one in 300,000 people. Um, despite that, though, although it is a uh, or aspects of colour blindness are quite rare, it's, it's really important to be inclusive of this and the different types of colour blindness as well, because if you're making a map or a visualisation that's going to reach a large audience, um, it's really likely that it will be reaching people with multiple types and multiple intensities of colour blindness. And actually, quite interestingly, there's a big difference between the sexes as well. So around 8% of men and only 0.8% of women in the UK are colour blind. And this is because the genes for red and green colour receptors are located on the X chromosome, um, of which men have only got one and females have got two. So for women, both of those chromosomes have to be affected for a woman to be colour blind. And as I said, I'm, I'm not colour blind myself and probably a lot of people on this call won't be. So um, thinking about some aspects of day to day life which can be affected by colour blindness. And I've got a few examples here, although obviously this isn't an exhaustive list at all, but it's it's good to just kind of raise awareness and think a bit more widely about where this is potentially going to be an issue for people. So in education, a lot of the time reds and greens are used as kind of denoting good and bad um, feedback. And if that's being used to kind of write comments, then you've obviously got the context of the words to let you know whether that feedback is positive or negative. But in this example on the on the screen um, where highlighters are being used and kind of blocks of colour are being used to call out specific parts of, of text and split those into categories, well, it's going to be quite difficult for people with that red green colour blindness to distinguish which is which. And it just creates a barrier for people in um, in the educational in industry and, and sector, as well as uh, much more further afield as well. And then thinking about sport, so actually there's a lot of feedback on, online a lot of the time about in football games, for example, where teams are using um, opposite teams using red and green shirts. Um, obviously, it's a lot harder for viewers of those sports to tell who's on what team. And as well in sports, when it's shown on screens, a lot of the time kind of visual commentary that comes up uses red and green colour schemes as well, which just adds another barrier to accessibility and makes it harder for those viewers to interpret. And then road signs um, is the third example I've got here. And obviously they are created in, in the UK at least to be red so that they stand out from the surrounding environment. Um, but the image on the left is what that road sign would look like to somebody with severe red green colour blindness. And you can see it's really quite muted. 
Um, and often the words on these signs will mean that the uh, signs can be read or interpreted agnostic to whatever colour they are. But it does just add another level of difficulty and, and kind of a barrier to noticing them. Um, and they don't have the same impact they were, that they were intended to have uh, when they were first created. So now thinking a little bit more about colour blindness in the context of mapping and uh, creating data visualisations. So a lot of the time, a huge amount of the time, in fact, colour is a really, really important part of map interpretation and can often be used to distinguish between different features um, or to show levels of a class on a spectrum from one end to the other, for example, or also maybe to highlight certain areas of a geographic location. And the map on the screen shows the legal and policy human rights situations of LGBT plus people in Europe in 2020. And if you're looking at this map as somebody who doesn't have colour blindness, you'll see that they've used a red to green scale of levels of equality across different countries. And now I'm going to switch this map to the simulation of what it appears to as somebody with deuteranopia, so that's the red green colour blindness. And you can see that two countries which kind of sit at either end of that spectrum, so Russia and Spain, um, now look a very similar shade of that kind of middle brown colour. And it is much harder to tell which countries are at either end of the scale. And then when I move to the simulation of tritonopic vision, so that's the blue yellow colour blindness, these colours appear quite different again, although it is a bit more clear which countries are at either end of that scale. Now, the original colours of this map on that red green um, colour scheme are clearly not very accessible for certain types of colour blindness. But what does make it a little bit easier in this instance and on this map, for example, is the fact that the creator of the map has included some labels and some percentage figures on top of each country to call out what the base colour of that country is actually trying to represent. And that means that the map isn't completely inaccessible for those with red green colour blindness because they can read those percentages instead and still get the data. But it is a lot harder to interpret and it loses a lot of the impact of the map. Um, and as I said, I'll go into some best practices like labelling and similar things a bit more towards the end of this session as well. So looking at some work that we've done at Ordnance Survey recently um, to create more accessible mapping and colour schemes and style sheets that can be applied to uh, data. When I started working on this piece of work uh, about a year ago, it became quite quickly apparent in the research stage that more than one colour scheme was going to be necessary, more than one alternative colour scheme, because for colour blindness, there's very much not a one size fits all solution. Because as I said, there's those different types of colour blindness who've got really quite different requirements and quite different needs. And so for that reason, um, we created two different style sheets, one for deuteranopic and protonopic, which is that red green colour blindness, um, and one for tritonopic and the blue yellow colour blind users. And these two style sheets were created for the OS Open ZoomStack product, which is completely open source, it's free to use, um, and it's won awards in the past as well, so it's a really popular OS product. Um, and it's very customisable as well, which made it perfect for this work because the symbology and the colours of every single feature can be adjusted, which means there's kind of maximum flexibility um, in terms of making this work better for people with colour blindness. Um, we've also hosted this style product with the different options for standard view, red green colour blind view, and blue yellow colour blind view as a web map, which you can get just in your in your browser. And that means it's quite a user friendly alternative for people who don't necessarily have a GIS background and aren't familiar with using those kind of geospatial softwares that you might um, otherwise use. So when we were creating these new accessible style sheets, we started off the process by doing a big piece of research and because I said I'm not colourblind myself, it was really important to fully understand the condition and what sorts of solutions are going to be able to help, especially with interpreting content digitally, um, because maps often are viewed on a screen, um, unless they're obviously the paper OS maps. But in this case, we were looking at um, kind of digital map creation.
So we put a notice out for employees OS. There's over a thousand employees at the organisation. So there's quite a few with colour blindness and those different types and different severities of colour blindness as well. And that meant that we had a bit of a focus group of employees who were able to give us feedback from their experiences of what's easier and what's really hard for them to differentiate between in terms of those features on the standard colour scheme of the Zoom stack map. And from that, we were able to get that list of features really to work on initially, which is what we used to start this process of kind of gradually adjusting colours, having continual feedback with those in the groups and really continue the project through quite an iterative um, phase of trial and error with different shades representing different features and establishing whether the changes were making it easier or harder for people to interpret. And just an example of some features specifically which were flagged up at the initial stage. So those with red green colour blindness reported that things like railway lines and electricity transmission lines looked a very similar um, colour of well, they're both line features. So they both appear as kind of greyish lines on the map and were quite hard to tell the difference between um, quickly. And then also different types of sites which are included on OS maps, so medical care sites, air transport sites, water transport sites, all appearing pretty similar um, hues of that kind of middle brown colour. And then also um, one specifically which we did a lot of work on was looking at urban areas against um, kind of the backdrop they appeared really muted and when you go into more zoomed in levels they kind of don't really stand out at all and, and really sit um, quite a muted shade against the backdrop of the map. And then two things as well, which we were given feedback on, which you definitely don't want to be confusing, are waterways and roads, which we were told were very similar hues and didn't stand out as distinctive separate features very easily at all for people with that red green colour blindness. And then people with blue yellow colour blindness, so the tritinopic vision, um, reported that things like woodlands, green spaces and national parks, which are all um, a fairly similar shade of green in OS mapping products, uh, were quite hard to distinguish between. So from that, we had a bit of a list of things that we wanted to target initially and that were the most important to do work on and make clearer and more accessible for those users. And there's some really good software actually, which can be used to simulate your screen on your laptop um, for what it would look like for different types of colour blindness. So a plugin for your computer called Colour Oracle, um, which adjusts the colours of whatever you're viewing on your screen. And it makes it appear as it would for those with red, green or blue, yellow or monochromatic vision. And using that meant that we could change the colours slightly and kind of do a really iterative, gradual process of seeing whether it got more clear or less clear on the map, um, as well as getting some hands on experience for what sorts of things are going to work best on these two new style sheets. And another piece of software that I thought was important to call out because it's a fab resource actually is called Colour Brewer. And that's a website that's been created for geospatial data visualization. And by inputting the type of data that you're using and how many classes you want to create colours for, it gives you a colour palette to use, which is going to both be accessible for people with colour blindness and also screen and printer friendly, which obviously a lot of the time maps are um, viewed on screens and printed. So I'd really recommend if you're wanting to check your own work or get some suggestions for colour palettes to use in your own visualisations to use those websites because they're really, really helpful for making sure that your work is accessible. And as I mentioned on the previous slide, this was quite a gradual process that we went through looking feature by feature at things, um, including the polygons, the points, the lines and the labels as well that made up that overall map. And after doing a bit of research, we found that we were getting much better results by just altering the contrast of features rather than assigning quite significantly different colours to them. And that also has benefits because it means that the map is going to have quite an overall um, expected colour scheme that than one you would expect to see on a map. It's not going to look vastly different. So, for example, we wanted to keep water features uh, in blue hues and vegetated areas with green hues. And actually, interestingly, we've had a lot of people who aren't colourblind saying that they prefer the new accessible alternative 
um, colour schemes on the maps because they've got clearer features like buildings and different types of vegetation that are clearly marked. Um, something else we did as well was making the backdrop land colour lighter from like a light beige closer to a white or a cream shade um, because that just helped with that contrast of the features against the backdrop. And then we exported these styles in a variety of formats. So we wanted to make sure they were going to be usable in a whole host of different GIS software packages, um, as well as SLD files, which is a bit of code that can be incorporated into a whole range of different programming languages. And then we also made sure um, that these two new style sheets were meeting the WCAG standards. So I think that's something that Claire touched on earlier, and it's a really important accessibility accreditation that is designed for all web content, but also it can be applied to maps which are hosted online as well. Um, and so, yeah, mostly the work that we did was to change that contrast between the colours, because obviously on a map, almost every feature can be found next to another feature. You never know if you know a building's going to appear next to uh, a field or a road or um, anything else. So we had to make sure that every single colour had enough contrast from every single other colour that was being used in the map. Um, and finally, the text as well that we were using, the colours for that was really important because we made the majority of these black where before they were a darker shade of the um, thing that they were calling out or actually the same shade as the backdrop with an outline. And so by making those black, they just stand out a lot more and have more contrast against the features which they're labelling. And then the table on this slide, so it shows a simulation of how that standard colour scheme um, is viewed as a colourblind person versus the adjusted colour scheme. So the left hand two images show the original styling um, viewed through a simulation of red green colour blindness and blue yellow colour blindness. And you can see that on the top left for red green colour blindness, um, things like railways and roads are quite similar hues and not too easy to interpret um, distinguish between. And also buildings on the backdrops of green spaces are very similar shades, so harder to interpret. And on the right hand side are the new styles viewed again as red, green or blue, yellow um, colour blindness. And you can see, especially in this example, that features like water and different types of green spaces like forests and parks are quite visibly different colours as well. So thinking about where you can access these maps and, and obviously trying to make it as accessible as possible to different types of users. Um, so these style sheets are available in those different formats from the Ordnance Survey GitHub account where you can download the style files um, and then apply those to the ZoomStack product in whatever GIS software you use. Um, and also that is a method which is a bit more tailored to those with a geospatial background who are really comfortable and familiar with using um, data in technical ways and in that specialist software. But obviously not everyone who's colourblind and wants to use accessible maps is going to have a GIS or technical background. So that's why we created the web map which can be just opened in your browser and that allows the user to simply click on the option of whichever whichever type of colourblind friendly style they would like to see and you can just pan around anywhere in Great Britain from very zoomed out scales at a national scale to a really local zoom level as well. And then thinking about the benefits that we've seen from doing this piece of work and, and really the benefits of championing accessibility both in map making and across other types of visualizations as well. So when we initially launched these styles, it was clear that they were having a really positive impact for a whole host of different types of map users in a range of industries. Um, and I've included a little bit of feedback along the bottom of this slide. But specifically focusing in on these, we've had um, feedback from teachers, for example. So in the UK, it's estimated that one child in every classroom is colourblind. Um, and obviously maps are a really effective tool in teaching, especially things like geography. Um, and so it's really important that students have got alternatives that are gonna make sure they're not at a disadvantage in the classroom so that they can interpret them and, and kind of have as few problems as possible with viewing those maps. Then we also have been talking with the Excel exam board. So at the moment in the UK, 
all GCSE geography exams include a map extract where the student has to kind of call out specific features and answer a few questions about what's in the map and what it's showing. And at the moment, there's actually only one alternative for um, any student with kind of visual impairments, and that is just an enlarged version of the exact same map. And obviously, um, an enlarged version of a map isn't going to help with interpreting features if you can't tell what colour those features are. So we've been working with our cartography team at OS and also the exam boards to um, get a accessible version for different types of colourblind students that they're going to be able to request in those exams if they need them. And also GIS professionals, so people who work in the geospatial industry and using that software to kind of manipulate data and use data. So at the, or in the past, they've taken that OS data or, or data from other sources and had to um, tailor it themselves and really make it work for their needs if they're colourblind. But by providing these accessible products and by championing accessibility in the industry, we're eliminating that process for them and taking the time and the effort off their hands by um, creating something ourselves. And also uh, members of the public as well. So I think a lot of the time in mapping and in data visualisation, accessibility is overlooked and especially colour blindness. Um, quite commonly, it's, it's uh, often used in mapping that like there'll be a rainbow spectral colour scheme which looks really amazing if you're not colourblind and like looks impressive but actually even if you're not colourblind is often not the greatest way of showing data it can be quite confusing and if you are colourblind a rainbow spectral colour scheme is going to be really hard to interpret what's meant to be what colour. So actually we've had a lot of really appreciative members of the public reaching out to us and not kind of offering their time and effort to help with similar things in the future. Um, and they were really appreciative that people are prioritising accessibility in data visualisation too. And then we've also been looking at the OS Maps app. So this is maps which are interactive and viewed on a mobile phone. Um, and getting those accessible styles into that app. So again, thinking about those wide range of users, um, whether that's people who are going to be viewing it in their browser or um, in specific software or on a phone. So we, we tried to be as um, tailoring to all of those different types of users as possible. And there's millions of people who use this app. So it really links in with what I mentioned earlier around content that's reaching a wide audience um, being crucial to be made accessible because you can guarantee that there's going to be a large number of colourblind users of this app as well. Um, and thinking about expanding the accessible range at OS, so we initially created these style sheets for the OS Open Zoom Stack products. Um, and it's, I think, really important to now roll this out to other products that OS create. So at the moment on the screen, you can see the vector map local product. And then on this screen, we can see the open map local product. And this is an example of those labels that have been made to be black rather than be a kind of more muted brown shade because they really do stand out more from the background and are kind of going to be a lot more easily interpretable for people with different types of vision deficiencies. And finally, some tips and tricks and kind of general principles for making your work, um, whether that's a map or some other type of visualisation accessible for colourblind people. So there's a few general principles uh, for good and bad things that I'll go through um, and a few good ones. So using labels in your map is a good idea because that's a, a really great way to call out what features are. And it means that colour isn't going to be the only way to tell whether a shape on a map is a forest or a lake, for example. And also using things like different types of fill um, rather than just block colour and where you're using lines to try and vary between dashed or bold or dotted lines so that you're getting another way to tell the difference between those features. And it's kind of going to be agnostic to colour as to the interpretation. So a good way to do this is to use things like SVG icons. Um, so, for example, in, in the middle circle, you can see at the bottom of this slide, we at OS include kind of coniferous tree icons in areas of coniferous forest. And that just means that there's another way for the user to tell what that polygon and that shape is going to represent, um, even if the colour in the background is um, not something they're going to be able to interpret too well. 
And as a, quite a general rule, although don't completely rely on this one, um, but it is a good starting point. If the visualization that you're trying to create is easily understandable when you apply a monochrome filter, it's likely to be understandable and accessible to those with color blindness. And then a few things which are kind of practices to avoid. And um, if you're doing these, then really consider whether it's essential or if there's another way you can go about it. So using that red and green color spectrum, as we saw earlier with the map, um, it's really ill advised actually. And, and in a lot of industries, there's a big push away from doing this. Often red and green is kind of denoting good and bad, but we should be looking for different ways we can do this and kind of using those labels or icons as well so that we're not just relying on a colour spectrum and not using a red and green colour spectrum. And also trying to avoid having colour as the only indicator of an item's classification. Instead, we should be looking to use things like labels and alternative fill patterns, as I mentioned as well. And finally, um, using a spectrum of colours which don't have much contrast from one another is likely to be a lot harder to interpret as a colourblind person. So even if your um, colour spectrum that you're using for your visualisation has a lot of shades which look very varied, so you might have like an orange and a green and a blue and a pink, um, if they're of a similar contrast, although they're different hues, it's likely that they're going to be harder for people with colour blindness to interpret. So if you vary those contrasts, so maybe you have a lighter orange, a darker blue and kind of a middle pink, that if you're viewing it through a grayscale filter, like I mentioned, is going to look a lot more varied and you will be able to tell um, the difference between each of those features. So it's a really good idea to vary the contrast as well. Um, and just to summarise, a couple of resources that are really useful. So I mentioned Colour Brewer earlier, and um, that's the website which will give you a uh, colour spectrum if you put in how many classes you wanted to use and the sort of data that you're inputting as well. And then there's the Colour Oracle plugin, which is just one that you can download from um, the internet and it's completely free and it simulates your screen as to what it would look like with uh, colour blindness and different types. And then finally, Adobe have got a really useful free to use tool, um, which is a kind of accessibility checker. And it has a, a, a circle with a spectrum, rainbow spectrum of colours, and you can select the colours that you're wanting to use in your visualisation. And it will tell you whether there's going to be any issues and gives you a bit of a view at the bottom as well of what that's going to look like um, to people with colour blindness. So yeah, that's the end of my section. Um, and I think we're doing a bit of a Q&A session now, but if you've got any questions that you think of later on in the week or further down the line, feel free to find me on, on LinkedIn or Twitter and drop me a message. I'll be more than happy to help. Thanks. Brilliant, thanks very much, Jess. And um, thanks to Nancy and Claire as well for your great presentations. Um, we've now got a bit of time for a, a Q&A session. Uh, we've had loads of questions submitted, um, so thanks very much to those um, that submitted questions. Um, we're not going to have time to answer all of them, unfortunately, but I'm going to put the most popular questions to our presenters. Um, the first question was on sharing the slides. Um, we won't be sharing the slides, but all of the information uh, covered in today's session um, will be available in some data visualization dashboard and accessibility guidance documents um, which we'll be putting links out uh, to very shortly um, so I'll, I'll take the next question um, so i think this one is probably one for all of our presenters so the question is what software or apps do you use to create the visualizations um, so i don't know if maybe claire or nancy do you want to come in on this one first? Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, so we tend to mostly use Excel, um, which I know sounds quite simple, but the point of it is to keep things clear, keep things simple and um, keep things straightforward. So Excel, we can do pretty much everything we want to do. Um, a lot can be done in things like R and Python and the analytical learning team do deliver some courses around data visualization in R and Python if you're interested in that. Um, we know that some people in other government departments use D3 and Power BI, which is also really good, um, but they do have some accessibility constraints as well, so just make sure that, that what you're doing does meet any accessibility requirements. 
Brilliant. Thanks very much, Nancy. Um, Jess, do you want to come in and say a bit about software on, on the mapping side? Yeah, happy to. So um, software that can be used for creating accessible things and, and making sure that stuff is accessible. So there's those few websites that I mentioned at the end um, around getting uh, really clear uh, colour schemes, which you can use for your visualisations and maps. And also QGIS, if people use QGIS um, software, which is a really common mapping software, then that's also got plugins which simulate your map view in the window as to what it will look like with different types of colour blindness as well. That's a really useful tool. Brilliant. Thanks very much um, for, for all of you on that one. Um, the next question. So um, what are your thoughts on selecting suboptimal charts um, purely to increase variety in a report? So as an example, using something like tree maps or bubble charts, even though they can be hard to interpret, um, but just to avoid boring users with too many bar charts or line graphs. I think that's probably um, Claire or Nancy on that one. Um, yes, yeah, I can come in on this. So I would say kind of ask yourself whether or not you need to be using lots and lots of the same charts. Um, so does your reader need the chart? Are they going to help you or can you actually just show a few key headlines um, and point them to accompanying data? So we, we have seen people use sort of a variety of charts to break up or to break up kind of using the same ones or kind of avoid things being boring. Um, I think as long as it's clear um, and easy to understand and easy to get the message, then that's OK. But I would avoid using a chart for using a chart's sake. Um, try and keep things simple, try and keep things short. Um, we know that users and readers don't spend too long on a page. So we want to just try and get the message across as easily as possible, really. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Nancy. Um, and I think another question probably for, for Claire or Nancy. Um, so there's a lot of interest in the in the donut charts um, in the questions. Um, so someone's asked, why would you use a donut chart over a pie chart? And I think there's also a question on, on why you'd use a donut chart over a, a stacked bar chart as well. Um, I think you did cover a bit of this, Nancy, in, in, in one of your sections. Um, I don't know if you, you just want to say a bit more about um, this one. Yeah, sure. Um, the donut is is slightly easier to interpret um, than a bar than a pie chart, sorry, um, because you're kind of comparing your angular length to an area, which is an area in a pie. So I think with a pie chart, you're initially drawn to the central point of a pie, and so then you're trying to compare areas where, as that's kind of taken out of a donut you then are drawn to compare the length and I think we're our brains are much better at comparing length than they are at comparing kind of areas and, and judging the linear difference. Um, using a donut over a, a stacked bar I think it probably just comes down to personal preference and um, I think it would depend on the number of categories that you've got as to whether or not a stacked bar might be a little bit easier to understand or if a, a donut might show what you want to show quite easily. Um, they're very, very similar. I think we probably tend to use bars a bit more than donuts just because they're easier to interpret. We don't have to kind of do any calculations. Um, yeah, Brilliant. Thanks very much, Nancy. And, and I guess related to that, so someone's um, said um, in the Q&A as well. Um, so I think you mentioned, Nancy, our eyes find it much easier to compare lengths than angles. So their question is, is it time to retire the use of pie charts and donut charts completely? Um, so I don't know, Nancy or Claire, have any thoughts on that? Yeah, possibly. Um, again, I think it's just preference. I think a lot of people will say pie charts uh, should should go and should have gone. I don't think we see that many people using pie charts in government. Some some people do. I think they have their place, um, but I think it is easier to compare lengths. So I think let's make it as easy as we can for our users and use bar charts probably more than the data and pies. Brilliant. Thanks, Nancy. Um, I'll move to the next question, uh, which I think is one for all of our speakers. Um, so is any work being done to ensure or examine consistency across government departments in the use of in the use of data visualization in government reports or publications? Um, so I think, yeah, 
interested in any views on that one. Maybe Claire or Nancy uh, start off. I'm happy to start. Um, I guess there are some kind of cross government groups that look at this sort of thing. Um, also being part of the best practice and impact division, we do kind of try and keep our eyes peeled for good practice examples that we can um, try and showcase either via our website or um, in collaboration with the Office for Statistics Regulation via the um, case studies that they publish as well. Um, and I guess if we did see um, a particularly bad example, then um, we can kind of get in touch with, with that producer and maybe give them some guidance. Um, and also uh, sometimes we, we kind of conduct reviews where we look at um, publications um, and with a kind of a sort of peer review type approach um, and kind of suggest um, improvements that could be made as well. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Claire. And then, yeah, I think that was a really good point. There's lots of examples from across government in the guidance documents that we'll post links to. Um, I wonder, Jess, did you have any thoughts on this in terms of, um, you know, consistent mapping visualisations across government? Yeah, it's something that we've been trying to do at OS more to create a, like a consistent OS brand um, and really help people who don't actually make maps every day OS, which is some people, um, to to get that kind of consistent look and feel to OS maps. But I think probably sessions like this are really useful to help people that work in the industry to get a kind of best practice idea and what sorts of things we should be doing, what sorts of things we should be avoiding. So. Yeah, probably this sort of session, I would say, is a really valuable way to do that. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Jess. Um, I've got a couple of specific mapping questions for you, Jess, if that's OK. Mm -hmm. um, so one of them's related to the, the colour blindness. Um, so someone's asked, are there any plans for the new OS Maps API to be made available for colour blindness styles? So yeah, at the moment there isn't an alternative for that OS Maps API, but something that I'm actually looking at in the very near future is rolling out these accessible style sheets to other OS products and right, really making sure that there's an alternative and an accessible version for things that put OS are putting out of the door. So at the moment, no, but maybe watch this space. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Jess. And then uh, just just one more specific uh, question on, on the mapping side about um, classifications. Um, so someone's asked, some maps could be misleading depending on the type of classification used. Please, could you share your thoughts on this? Um, and they're also wondering what type of classification would you recommend as a default? Um, yeah, it's a good point, actually, and I don't know that there's a default kind of classification per se for, for all maps. It really depends on the data types that you're using um, and the data that you're trying to show as well. Things like um, chlorothpleth maps, for example, can be a really good tool, but are quite often used in ways that aren't great for visualisation. Um, I'd say for more detail on that, there's some really good resources online, um, especially from Esri, actually. They make a lot of um, courses about the ways that and different ways that types of map classifications should be used. Um, I think there's a an online free course about cartography that they run uh, fairly often, which is a great one for considering what the type of map you should be using for your type of data is. Um, but yeah, I don't think there's necessarily a one size fits all go to solution, really. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Jess. Uh, given time, we've probably got time for a, a couple more questions. Uh, so someone's asked about qualitative data. Um, be keen to hear your thoughts on presenting qualitative data if possible. Um, so just open it up, really. Has, has anyone got any um, thoughts on that? Maybe Claire or Nancy um, coming on that one. I, I have just have to confess that I don't really have any um, real experience in that area. I did some kind of open text analysis once um, many years ago in a department, but that never really got round to kind of actually being presented publicly. Um, that's not a very helpful answer. Sorry. 
I don't. No, yeah. no problem, Claire. We, I, I, we, I'm sure we can find some more information um, and come back on that one uh, maybe after the session. Um, I'll, I'll go to another question, which which I think um, Claire and Nancy will have some some good thoughts on. So, so dashboards have been used quite a lot uh, recently. Um, so someone's asked, are there any good resources for designing dashboards? Um, I think we have some guidance on this. So I'll maybe look to to Claire and Nancy just to say a bit about that. Yeah, this, we have some guidance on the GSS website, which we'll share a link to afterwards. Um, I think, again, it's about just keeping things simple. I think a lot of people want to make things interactive or really fancy. Um, I think, again, it's just thinking about who who might be using these, these dashboards and what they might, might want out of it. Um, so keep things clear, keep things simple. Um, don't try and cram too much on a page. Um, but we've got some really useful guidance um, online that will help you sort of designing and thinking about whether or not you need to use the dashboard. Brilliant, thanks Nancy. Um, and yeah, as Nancy said, we'll, we'll share um, a link to, to some of the resources Nancy mentioned um, as well. Um, I'm going to go to just one last question. Um, so this question is, could you recommend any resources, books, websites, podcasts, YouTube channels for people to keep learning about data viz? Um, and they personally recommend the storytelling with data website and podcast. I know throughout all of your presentations, I think you mentioned a lot of other resources on data viz, but is there any particular ones you wanted to highlight? Um, open it up to any of you really on that one. I think there's some really excellent blogs from from cartographers actually. Um, I know there's a couple that I read quite often. I can't think of the names exactly now, but I'm happy to share those, uh, find them and, and share them after the session. Um, just blogs and also even on Twitter and things when you come across visualizations that you like, I find it's always really worth saving those and coming back to them for inspiration. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, actually, the Esri cartography course is a fab resource for getting um, into cartography and different types of visualization with maps. Um, that's a free one as well. Brilliant, thanks Jess. Um, Claire or Nancy, is there any particular resources you'd like to highlight? I just echo what Jess said. I think uh, Twitter is a really great way. We've got a lot of government analysts who um, tweet about their work and, and um, good practice in data visualisation. So um, have a look for people uh, through that. I think we're, we're promoting a lot of, of blogs um, as part of our African government month where you'd be able to kind of pinpoint who might be doing stuff in this space. Um, there's also kind of TED talks and that sort of stuff, which we encourage you to, to listen to, depending on kind of what um, part of data visualisation takes your interest um, and also kind of following people like from the BBC or The Guardian and their data visualisation leads. They also put out some really interesting material. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Nancy. Um, that's all we've got time for now. Um, so yeah, just to say thanks to all of you for attending today's session. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Uh, thanks to all the presenters as well. Um, as I said, we'll send some links uh, to some useful resources on data visualization. If you've enjoyed today's session,